Dr. Rick Hodes, our guest, he's medical director of Ethiopia for the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, known as the Joint. Uh, did you start to call it that? Somebody name it that? Many, many years ago, it was called the Joint. Mm -hmm. So I joined just 21 years ago. Where do you live, live? Your I home. live in a house. I rent a house in, uh, as we say, a villa, a private house in Addis Ababa, not so far from the airport. Um, it has three bedrooms on the inside, three bedrooms on the outside. I have one room as <clears throat> my room, another room as, as the office, and then I have some kids living there who are my patients. Right now, for example, we just got a group back from Ghana. Two of the kids are from deep in the countryside, so they weren't able to return home because I need to keep an eye on them for about six weeks. So one of them is on one couch, the other's on another couch right now. So dinner at Dr. Rick's, maybe breakfast at Dr. Rick's house. Uh, what's that about? What's that like? So Just it, tell me about a typical day in your life. I wake up in the morning at 6.30 in the morning and I turn on the light next to my bed to see if I'm going to have electricity that morning. Okay, so I, electricity is there but not always there. Right. Then I go into the bathroom, I turn on the water to see whether I have water. And often this time of year we don't have water. Did you camp as a kid or anything? I did. <laughs> you must have because I'm very much used this to doesn't this seem to be bothering you too much. What about gas for cooking? Gas for cooking, we, we buy. It comes in big mm. cylinders, and about every week or two, we buy it. Do you have jerry cans of water or something? So in case yeah, there's we no do water in the morning or, or any of that, uh, do you have a swimming pool that you can <laughs> shower in or no. swim in? Nothing. So it's not fancy dancy. Nothing fancy. Is the point. Nothing fancy. Mm -hmm. and Ethiopians for breakfast, or they love this big round, uh, it's like a pancake called injera. So, and injera is made by poor women. It's like this big. We get 25 injeras delivered every morning. And, you know, I have all these foster kids and patients yes. who are healing in my house. And so that's what they eat. They eat these injera with different sauces mm. during the daytime. Mm. How many children did you adopt? I've five? adopted five. One of them is healthy, and then four of them have major med medical issues. Mm. Uh, and they live with you? Uh, well, actually, most of them are in the States right now at, at either high school or university. Oh, really? Yeah. So there, you've adopted them, they go to school in the States, so they're educated. What about education, Ethiopia, education, uh, young girls, uh, educating young girls, not always It's a very important easy. thing. And in fact, one of the things that we do at JDC is we build schools in the rural areas. So for example, there's a young boy here in Vancouver mm. named Justin Seagull who was in Ethiopia. Mm. He saw 10 boys sitting on rocks and reading. And he said, what are they doing? And they said, well, these kids have no school. So he came back to Vancouver. He started a project called the Spread the Love Project and gave us enough money, JDC. We built a rural school. 60 kids showed up for the first day, 30 boys and 30 girls. So female education is the key to development in Africa. Mm -hmm. There's no question about that. In most countries, if you educate the women. And right, because you know, if you educate a woman, she's going to raise up the whole family. Mm -hmm. That's the really wonderful thing. And, and tell the husband what to do. No, exactly. <laughs> and make sure the daughters are educated and the granddaughters are educated. Mm -hmm. Very so much so. The whole society is going to be mm -hmm. raised In up. all third world countries. Yeah. And as you know, women aren't as valued in those cultures often. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I have a picture I show when I do a presentation. And I say, who does the carrying in rural Ethiopia? It's not the men. It's the women and it's the donkeys. And it's donkeys with things on their back and women with things on their head. Mm -hmm. that's, that's sort of the paradigm of what goes on. Yes, and very strong necks. Right. I know. Uh, we've all tried that once, <laughs> to balance something on our heads. A book's hard. Yeah. So imagine. How do they do this, right? I, I don't can't know. Do that. I can't do that. No, I can't do that either, nor do I have to. And in Ethiopia, you have these people Today. who come. Right. You have people who were carrying firewood. They may have mm. women. Barefoot women may have 100 pounds of firewood. I've actually paid them to try it on myself. They laugh because I can't do it. It's so heavy. I can't mm -hmm. imagine how these women are walking miles with this stuff. Uh, Stephen Lewis, who I don't know if you know or not. Yeah, I uh, do know who he is. Uh, uh, he's, uh, his frustration, I think, his base frustration with HIV, AIDS, Africa, all of that, is that we have the drugs to help the people. We have the drugs to stop dysentery. We have the drugs, the simple drugs, to save lives. and it's impossible to get help to some of these places. What frustrates you about groundwork in Ethiopia or Zaire? In Ethiopia, nothing is easy. Every step is difficult. There's huge bureaucracy. It takes a long time to get a little thing done. To get a passport for a patient may take weeks, things like that. But mm -hmm. we keep on going. We keep on going. 
uh, Albania, when you were in Albania, what happened there? So I know what happened there, but... What happened was um, there was bombing in Kosovo, and then the Kosovo refugees fled into Albania. Mm -hmm. So Albania, which, is, uh, which had been this terribly repressive communist country, ended up with thousands and thousands of refugees. The Albanian people are amazing. They have this true kindness to them. They took in refugees. They took in people who they didn't know, and they lived in their house for months. Even like during World War II, the Albanian people, Albania was the only country in Europe, it's a Muslim country by the way, yes. it's the only country in Europe which increased its Jewish population because they hid Jews during World War II. And post-ethnic cleansing, all of that, uh, the horrendous shape that people were in. Yeah, I mean, because they fled. And uh, I mean, they were somewhat developed people. These weren't like African refugees. But they have diabetes. They have hypertension. They have all these diseases. They left without their medicines. They arrived in Albania. And then we had to start from scratch. What have you learned about resilience and survival? What inspires The core of resilience in, in humans. You know, my patients go on with their lives. They have terrible backs. And they are not discouraged. What gives me hope is when I, I learn from my patients. It's an honor to take care of them. When I see the dignity and the difficulties they live with day in and day out, mm -hmm. it makes me stronger and it makes them stronger. I mean, these kids just keep on going. And I think sometimes these African kids can face a lot more than we, we can. Mm -hmm. One of my own kids never knew his father. His mother died. His grandmother died. He had TB of the spine, 90 degree angle. He was abandoned in a church. And now, he, you know, to meet him, he'll tell you this like he's reading a grocery list from Safeway. And, um, and he's really quite okay and quite happy. I've interviewed a couple child soldiers who somehow, in the midst of all uh, of that, found joy or hope. One of the kids that we took into our house probably 10, 15 years ago was a child soldier. He had, he had been, I mean, he spent his teenage years as a mass murderer. He was killing people mm -hmm. in Mengistu's army. Then he was a refugee in the Gulf in the, on an island. And then he arrived back in Ethiopia. I gave him a job at the house. One day I, said, I was doing some work and I didn't have my watch. And I said, what time is it? He said, I don't know. And I said, can you just check? And he says, no, I don't know how to tell time. And I, this is a guy who's 20 years old at the time. I said, can you read? Can you write? He said, nothing. So we taught him how to read. We taught him how to write. <clears throat> we taught him how to tell time, and he started at the age of 20 in first grade. And he sat there with these little kids. He's now mm. a nurse who works for me. Mm. Will you ever go back to New York to live? Well, we'll see. We'll see. We'll uh, see. <laughs> I, I, I sense not. I'm quite happy with what I'm doing. And what I'm doing now, I'm getting more attention and more money, and I'm trying to expand. Mm. So my goal is really to build my own hospital, to be able to... <clears throat> teach some of these skills to be done inside Ethiopia. And getting more money, I know, is one of your missions, as it should be. Yeah. Uh, the Seagulls, very philanthropic family in this town. How did you meet them? Uh, Gary and Justin came to Ethiopia on a <clears throat> Jewish Federation mission to look around Ethiopia and see what was going on. And <clears throat> they were a big help to me. We became friends. And then they met one of my patients, a boy with a TB of the spine named um, Tesfai. Tesfai had a spine like um, a, a dinosaur. And he couldn't be operated on in Ghana. It was too difficult. And so Gary arranged for him to be operated on at uh, BC General Hospital by Dr. Dvorak and mm. his team. At the Vancouver General. Uh, yeah. Was it? Yeah, great spine. Oh, uh, they're fantastic. Great spine hospital. They're fantastic. Uh, yes. And so he flew over. Teaching he, hospital saved my life. Absolutely. Yeah. And so they did a great job with him. OK. Nice to meet you. Thank you like that hat. and I, It's the, made by my patients. I bet it is. Uh, time you sold them, I think. We can find you a trendy little boutique here. Raise a I'll little work, money. I'll work on that. Huh? I'll work on I that. I like that idea. Thank you. And an evening to bring back hope, April 4th here. Right. To raise some money. Right. For and you and what you do. And, and a partnership with uh, the University of British Columbia Division of International Surgery. Great. Thank nice you Nice to much. meet you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rick Hodes.